Okay, welcome back. So now we're going to start talking about kind of just some basics here with data manipulation and descriptive statistics. Okay, so we know we've introduced this definition, what descriptive statistics is, right? This is where we're, we're summarizing, we're organizing our data, we're making it presentable. Right? This is one of the kind of two main branches of statistics. Now remember, we don't really use descriptive statistics to draw conclusions. Yes, we can get some interesting information out of our, our graphs, our charts, our numbers that we calculate. Right, But it's really more just for informational purpose, purposes. Okay, so getting into descriptive statistics, what are we really trying to do with descriptive statistics? The main thing we're trying to do is describe what we would call our, our variable or our data set's distribution. So the, the technical definition of, the, of a distribution, what are the possible values that a variable can take on and how often does it do so? Right, so there are mathematical ways of describing that distribution or there's, there's visual ways. A graph or some sort of table chart is the easiest way of looking at a variable's distribution. So usually we want to visually assess what we've got going on first and then use numerical descriptors to describe that distribution. Right? But what we'll see is we really need to look at it visually first because what we've got going on there, if we see any patterns, if we see a certain shape of that distribution, right, there will be different numerical summaries that will be more appropriate. Okay, so when we're doing descriptives, we always want to look at it visually first. So when we're looking at it visually, what's, what's our goal here? Right? We'll basically just find and get a nice picture here to show patterns in our data. But what we'll see is depending on the type of data, so we, we should know at this point how to determine, to look at a data set and say, okay, this variable is this type this variable is this type. Two main types of data that we're thinking about here we know are categorical and quantitative data. So out of the list of things that will work for categorical data, or the list of, of methods that will work for quantitative data, each of those certain methods have their own pros, have their own cons, right, and may show certain aspects more than others. So depending on the question I'm trying to answer, or the aspect I'm trying to highlight, I may choose certain methods over others. But in general, all of these methods should show the values that a variable takes on right, and how often it does so. So this is a new word for us, frequency. It's basically just a fancy word that means count. Right? It tells us how often does a variable take on a certain value. Okay, So frequency means count. So that's what we're trying to do with our graphical or visual methods. What are we trying to do numerically? Right? Well, this is when we're just taking a large data set, maybe it's a whole bunch of numbers, and we just want to summarize those with, with just a few numbers. So what are the most important things to summarize? Well, typically we're most interested in the, the center, or the most typical value, the central tendency of a data set. Right, there are multiple ways to quantify that. Right, we're also interested in a variable's variability or the variation that exists there. Okay, and oftentimes we're also interested in is there anything that kind of sticks out to us? These are things that we might refer to as outliers. Right, so we'll see how to find those. Now remember the type of data that we have really dictates the tools that are available to us. The first thing that we're going to look at are called frequency tables. And you can sum up categorical or quantitative data in frequency tables. Okay, but if I have categorical data, some of my options are pie, pie charts and bar charts. If I have quantitative data, we have a lot more options there. Okay, so we'll get into those in the future. But for now, we're going to focus on our most basic way of organizing data, our frequency table. Okay, so a frequency table, basically what it does is it takes our data 
and it divides it up into groups or what we might call bins or classes and then it counts the frequency that fall into each of those classes. Now if you already have, if you're working with categorical data, right, we know our data is already divided up into classes or categories intuitively. Okay, so that's nice. So it's super easy to make one of these with categorical data. All right, but quantitative data on the other hand, right, we'll just have a big list of numbers. Okay, so with quantitative data, we have to decide ourselves, how should I divide this data up? And we'll go over some kind of ground rules for that. Okay, but first of all, we've already defined frequency. We know what frequency means. We see this new word here, relative frequency. So what's the difference? We know frequency means count, whereas a relative frequency means the percentage or proportion of the whole that's represented by that class or that bin or that group. Okay, so if we have a frequency, how do we find a relative frequency? Well, we just take the frequency, divide by the total, that leaves us with our relative frequency. All right, so very easy to find. But just terminology-wise, frequency is count. Relative frequency is the percentage of the whole. Okay, so first let's look at a simple categorical frequency table. And actually this one's going to be a relative frequency table. So this is a from a survey of students about their majors. Okay, we simply list each category. Right? We have these predefined categories, these predefined groups and the relative frequency or percentage that fall into each one. Okay, so super simple. I don't think we need to do much more explaining on that. Okay, but so, so we're seeing how categorical variables, we already have this way to divide them up. The question is, okay, what if we're working with quantitative or numerical data? How do we divide these up? We don't have these nice predefined categories. Okay, we have to divide them into groups, intervals, bins, or classes ourselves. So say I had a list of people's ages, all right, age 20 to age 70, 69, whatever. Well, here, there would be a nice, neat, intuitive way of dividing those up, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, and so on. Now, it's not always going to be like this, right? It, with quantitative data, we're not always going to have such a nice, neat way to divide things up like this. But let's just say to define a few things that we do have an easy way to do it here. So consider the 30-year-old class. All right. So our 30-year-old class is from age 30 to 39. 30 we would call our lower class limit. 39 we call the upper class limit. So easy enough. Next thing we want to define is our bin width. Right, our bin width for the 30-year-old class. Now, there's different ways of finding this, and sometimes it depends on how our data is formatted, or right, whether we have decimals, whatever. The easiest way to find your bin width is just to take the difference in consecutive lower class limits. Just notice it's not your upper class limit minus the lower class limit. It's the difference in consecutive limits. So our bin width here would be 10. Last thing we want to find here is our class midpoint. All right, so our class midpoint, we take our upper class limit plus our lower class limit, divide by two, just find a basic midpoint there. Okay, so this was an example of when we have a nice, easy, intuitive way of dividing up quantitative data, right? But what if we don't? Well, there's no exact ways of doing it or no perfect rules, really, but there are some kind of basic guidelines to follow. So some general guidelines we should think about. Our bins, they shouldn't overlap, they shouldn't have gaps, they should all be the same size for the most part, and they should cover all of our data. Okay, so that's one thing to think about. That's the basics to think about. We also usually want to make our upper and lower class limits and our bin width what I would call reasonable number. Fives, tens, whole numbers if we can. Again, kind of depends on the format of our data, but we want it, we want them nice and clean, nice and reasonable. Okay, so another question is, well, how many bins should we use? 
Well, generally a nice starting point is the square root of your number of observations. And so it depends on how many observations, but anywhere from 5 to 20 bins is usually pretty good. We don't want too few because it will just come out looking like a big, big box. But we don't want too many because that can kind of create some weird effects also. Okay, so again, this is when we have quantitative data that may not have a perfect intuitive way of breaking it up. So we'll quickly here look at a frequency table from a data set, and this is about the uh, compression strength of a, a group of golf clubs. Okay, so before we do anything, right, we always want to think about all these ideas of I got to cover my range, I got to do all this. Okay, so we want to think about how many observations do I have? Well, we have 80 golf clubs here. All right, my max PSI here was 245, my minimum was 76, therefore I had a range of 169. All right, hopefully you're familiar with how to find the range of a data set. Okay, number of bins, starting point. Well, the square root of my number of observations, 80, that's a almost 9. I wanted to cover my range, so dividing my range by the number of bins starting point gives me 18.9 for a bin width. So those are the things I want to think about, but remember I want my numbers nice and clean. Alright, so we can't have 8.9 bins, right? So let's say we wanted to do 9. Let's pick a nice round number of 20 here. Okay, so 20 class width times 9 gives me 180. All right, my minimum is 76, so let's start at 70. 180 should cover the entire range. Okay, so these are my nice neat numbers that I would like to work with and create a frequency table that looks like this. And we'll see an example in the future with the actual data, creating one of these from scratch. But this is the, the general idea. Alright, so thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.